So good afternoon, everyone. Let me welcome you to our second seminar meeting, sponsored by the Harvard Divinity School. The seminar is entitled The Sacrifice of Children on the Altar of Capitalism, Bearing Witness in the Writings of Russell Banks. This is done in preparation for his Ingersoll Lecture in Saunders Theater on November the 5th. Those of you who've been faithfully coming to the seminar, you're lucky because you get free tickets. But in order to get free tickets, you have to sign the piece of paper that Charlene has been passing around um, because in order for you to retrieve those tickets, we have to have a record that you've been to at least two of these workshops. And you know the third workshop will be meeting on November the 5th with a panel presentation and Russell Banks himself. So please make sure you do that. Tickets will go on sale to the general public two weeks beforehand and soon after this meeting today Charlene will be sending out an email about how you're going to be able to retrieve your tickets. Uh, each of you is eligible to get two tickets for the Ingersoll lecture and we hope all of you will come to that as well. Any questions about that? Any questions about that everybody? Uh, November the 5th we're going to probably be meeting at noon, and the third meeting will be up in the faculty club in the um, eastern east dining room, and we'll be sending out information about that. <coughs> and then the Russell Banks lecture is that afternoon around 5.15, 5.30. You will recall that two years ago, the Harvard Divinity School held a seminar, similar seminar in preparation for Toni Morrison's Ingersoll Lecture. That seminar, which was also organized by Stephanie Paul Sell and myself, was entitled Have Mercy, the Religious Dimensions in the Writings of Toni Morrison. Both of these seminars, that one and this one, are part of the Harvard Divinity School's work of linking religious dimensions in human experience to the arts and crafts and the historicity of creative writing. And it's also part of the Harvard Divinity School's work of being in a fruitful dialogue with students and staff and faculty from other schools at Harvard and especially the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. This time, religious dimensions follows the language of the phrase bearing witness that is bearing the heavy and painful load of witnessing to, in Russell's writing, the unbearable death of children in a school bus accident, bearing witness to the overwhelming suffering of migrants from Haiti and from New Hampshire, of bearing witness to the flames and madness of slavery and the evil brew it generated in all of the people of the United States, bearing witness to the afflictions in families where fathers despise their sons and mothers look away in distraction. We're interested in the testimony, the way that Russell Banks takes a stand, declaring that we Americans created in our hatred or greed and our stupidity from the foundations of the country something called slavery and planted seeds of the destruction of democracy that needed a cloud splitter. A few of you have approached me and wondered why I as an historian of religions have come to know these novelists in both intellectual and personal ways why me and Morrison and now me and Banks? Let me tell you a little bit about why. Like many of you, I was a childhood and teenage reader of novels. My mother had both cheap and deep novels around the house. <laughs> and I came to think of novels as instruments of knowing about the emotional, imaginary, and political world I lived in and wanted to understand in all its amazing complexity and enigmas. The first real novelist I met in person was the Mexican-American writer John Rechie. 
whose brother had grown up with my father and our family were friends. John, John Ritchie wrote a great novel called City of Night and it related my El Paso to cities of sex, gay sex, homosexual culture, and those people who hunted gays down in cities all over the country. James Baldwin praised this novel, City of Night, <coughs> and Retchie as a writer, quote, who had a kind of discipline that allowed him a wild and beautiful reckless. Today, Retchie is appreciated as a pioneer in LGBT literature. Later, when I studied at the University of Chicago under the historian of religions and novelist Mircea Iliade, I was fascinated by his wider, richer view of how novels were instruments of knowledge into our histories, mythologies, revolutions, psychologies, and soul searching. When I worked as Iliade's secretary, I learned how both his writings on history and his novels fed into each other and provided him with a kind of freedom. In his essay, Literary Imagination and Religious Structure, Iliadi wrote about how he oscillated between writing the history of religion and writing novels. Three of those novels were made into films. And he said he did this to maintain a spiritual equilibrium, a balance between what he called the diurnal and nocturnal modes of his life. Iliadi, who wrote The Forbidden Forest, Isabel and the Devil's Waters, and The Light That Failed, felt that both scientific research and creative writing were spiritual activities. He wrote, I know from my own experience that some of my literary creations contributed to a more profound understanding of certain religious structures, and that sometimes without my being conscious of the fact at the moment of writing, fiction, the literary imagination utilized materials or meanings I had studied as a historian of religions. <coughs> literary creation constitutes an instrument of knowledge because the literary imagination reveals unknown dimensions and aspects of the human condition. <coughs> For me as an historian of religion and novelist, the writing of fiction became a fascinating experience in method. Let me get some water. <coughs> Indeed, in the same way as the writer of fiction, the historian of religions is confronted with different structures of sacred and mythical space, different qualities of time, and more specifically by a considerable number of strange, unfamiliar, and enigmatic worlds of meaning. Today's seminar session is very fortunate to have a guide to take us into the enigmatic, historical, mythical novel, Cloud Splitter, and the life rebellion of John Brown, whose, bodies, whose body, the song says, is a moldering in the grave, but whose soul goes marching on. And March it does in the tremendous literary creativity of Russell Banks. Our guide is John Stauffer, who's on leave with a fellowship from NEH this year, but who's come out to work with us. <coughs> John and I have had several soulful meetings about Russell Banks' work and life and he wisely gave us the assignment to read chapter 13 in Cloud Splitter. John Stauffer is the professor of English and African and African American studies here. Let me just tell you a couple of titles of his books to bring him on. One of his early books is called The Black Hearts of Men, Radical Abolitionist and the Transformation of Race. It won the Organization of American Historians Avery Craven Award for the most original book on the coming of the Civil War, the Civil War years, or the era of Reconstruction. It won McGill's Literary Annual Award. It won second place for Frederick Douglass Book Prize for the best book on slavery or abolition. The New York Times said, Stauffer knows what he has with this remarkable story. He deftly outlines the thinking of his subjects and is especially good at showing the links 
between their religious beliefs and their politics. Another book is called Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. One of the critics says, this is the most insightful book about race and friendship in the 19th century that I have read. It's poignant and perceptive, a book to be savored, a book that will last. Still another one, The Problem of Evil, The Problem of Evil, Slavery, Freedom, and the Ambiguities of American Reform, and even closer to today's topic, Meteor of War, The John Brown Story with Zoe Trod. There's other books, but this is John Stauffer, who's been strangely drawn to John Brown, a man who, in the words of Owen Brown in a novel, was, quote, against all conventional thinking on matters of slavery. John Brown, who told Frederick Douglass that he was ready to go forth and, quote, make the blood sacrifice for both our peoples. John Brown, who in the eyes of Russell Banks did, quote, the bloody work of the Lord. John Brown, the man who entered history and enters our history at HDS through a novel guided by John Stauffer, who's here to tell us about that history and that novel. Please welcome my colleague and friend, John Stauffer. Thank you, David. Can everyone hear me? So I'm going to speak a bit on John Brown in relation to Russell Banks' novel, and then I want to open it up for discussion. I'm going to prompt you with questions about the chapter. Feel free to uh, interrupt or interject at any moment. Ideally, this will uh, quickly evolve into a discussion rather than a monologue. I'll start by telling you a little bit about my relationship with Cloud Splitter. Uh, it was published in 1998. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, a Penn Faulkner Award. Uh, I was working on my dissertation, which became my first book, The Black, Black Hearts of Men, which is a, uh, the best way to summarize it, it's a collective biography of two blacks and two whites who forged bonds of interracial friendship and alliance that were uh, unprecedented in the 19th century and wouldn't be repeated till into the civil rights era and it was based on the largest cachet of interracial letters and John Brown is one of the figures, Frederick Douglass is a figure, uh, James McCune Smith who's the foremost black intellectual before Du Bois is the third and the fourth is Garrett Smith, a wealthy white upstate New Yorker who appears uh, in Cloud Splitter. And I read Banks' novel. I'm tr I was trained in American studies, so I was, uh, was trained in both American literature and American history. And Banks immediately um, seemed to me one of the foremost living writers in the depths of the questions that he explores, in the extraordinary um, beauty of his form and the relation between his choice of form and the content and how that re uh, how it, um, it uh, resonates so brilliantly. Uh, and in this case, the depths of his research, it was very clear to me that Russell Banks had mined uh, deeply the archives of John Brown, which I was very familiar with because I had too. Uh, and I was also familiar with the long history of scholarship on John Brown and the abolitionists and what especially struck me about Cloud Splitter was that this novel is the first narrative, the first story since W.E.B. Du Bois's biography of John Brown in 1909 that highlights John Brown's relationships with blacks, highlights the fact that we cannot begin to understand John Brown without understanding his relationships with the blacks and the fact that he lives with them from 1847 uh, until really the end of his life. Uh, and uh, that helps us to, it complicates, uh, and which Banks brilliantly does, the widespread um, notion of Brown as either a madman or a martyr, a sinner or a saint. Now, some of the historiography, Brown by, John Brown by the Civil War, Banks ends his novel with Harper's Ferry. Brown is best known for raiding the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in October of 1859 with an interracial army of 16 whites and five blacks. Uh, briefly takes over the arsenal, 
with his men. He's captured 24 hours later uh, by uh, troops led by Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart. Uh, he is uh, tried, sentenced for murder and treason, and executed on December 2nd, 1859. That raid in Harper's Ferry and the responses that it generates in the North and the South became a crucial catalyst that led to the Civil War. The raid itself can be seen as a kind of microcosm uh, of uh, the Civil War. And uh, after, during the war itself, Brown becomes a national hero. John Brown's body, of, uh, which I will play um, later, is a, um, the, the Union mascot. It's the most popular hymn in the Union Army. Virtually every Union soldier sings John Brown's body's lying in the grave, his soul is marching on, as inspiration as they march and prepare to fight and possibly die uh, for, the, for various causes. But Brown becomes a true hero. It's even someone like President Lincoln considers Brown a heroic American during the war. It highlights the degree to which uh, John Brown's right and the Civil War constitute a social revolution, as suggested in Banks's title, Cloud Splitter. This is a new, uh, a new era, almost the equivalent of a new dispensation. So from the end of the Civil War through the 1890s, John Brown was considered a great hero in the North by whites and by blacks. And blacks have always seen Brown as a great hero. But then in the service of reconciliation and reunion, by which I mean the efforts of white Southerners and white Northerners to reunite, set aside their differences. Everyone at the time understood that the Civil War is about slavery, so it meant that slavery needed to be uh, downplayed and ignored. Uh, and uh, Brown and the other abolitionists then either, either erased or demonized. So throughout um, the vast majority of the 20th century, Brown is considered, um, in many respects, a kind of Milton Satan figure. And this is true among some of the foremost historians. Um, C. Van Woodward, Robert Penn Warren, the writer, cast John Brown as a, a kind of Milton Satan, a figure so demonic, he's actually fascinating. Uh, beginning in the 60s, uh, scholars begin to resurrect Brown, but they're still very uncomfortable about him. Uh, and uh, Banks really be charts or begins, his novel really coincides with the shift in how scholars begin to think of John Brown. Uh, in this novel, Owen Brown is the narrator, which serves Banks, in my view, um, very well. Owen Brown was the third son of John Brown, and Owen Brown uh, fought with his father in Kansas. He was one of the raiders at Harper's Ferry. Owen Brown was one of five raiders to escape. And when he escapes, he goes to California. He lives in mountains of uh, California, uh, and dies in uh, 1889. Banks have him, has him li live a little longer because the framework, the framing device of the novel is that Miss Mayo, who's an assistant uh, to uh, Oswald Garrison Villard, who writes the first great biography of John Brown in 1910, and she is an actual historical assistant, writes Owen Brown asking for his help in uh, remembering his father, and that prompts the novel at the very beginning. But it also functions as a way for Banks himself to see John Brown through the sun's eye. It allows Banks to offer his own understanding of this revolutionary figure. It offers Banks a way to explore the nature of sacrifice, the possibility of redemption, the relationship between martyrdom and suicide, the, both, the possibilities of bearing witness, and especially the costs of bearing witness to social evils, the limits of empathy, 
the sources, the deep sources of anger and of suffering. These are all crucially important themes that the framing device allows banks to accomplish, to achieve in the novel. Uh, and as I mentioned, the archival work that Banks did is as rigorous as just about any scholar. So in the chapter you read, the meeting between Frederick Douglass and John Brown is taken from Douglass's third autobiography in which Douglass gives more details of his close friendship with John Brown than any other source. And Banks then fills in the gaps, trying to understand this relationship, this interracial relationship, uh, and both uh, what the limits are and what the successes are. So before I go further about highlighting and prompting and provoking you to help me better explore and understand how this novel relates to the larger themes of the Ingersoll Lecture Series and of Banks's talk, let me give you a brief sense of Brown's life for those of you who may not be familiar with it. John Brown was born in Torrington, Connecticut in 1800, so when he raids Harper's Ferry, he's almost 60 years old. Uh, most of his raiders, black and white, are half his age. Uh, he moves as a young boy to Torrington, or from Torrington, uh, Connecticut to Ohio. His mother dies and Banks makes use of possibly one source of the anger is because Brown hasn't gotten right with the fact that his mother dies. Uh, Banks also refers in the chapter um, that you read uh, of John Brown watching a boy when he goes to the Hudson, uh, uh, the Hudson area of Ohio, uh, watching a slave boy getting whipped and beaten with a shovel when he's eight or nine years old, and that turns Brown into a staunch abolitionist. It's, that's an accurate portrayal from Brown's own very brief autobiography that he tells a fellow abolitionist. Um, uh, in earlier in Banks' novel, he points out that Brown trains uh, for the ministry. He, throughout his life, is a deeply religious figure, and you see this in Banks' novel. Uh, he, his efforts to become a minister failed because he ran out of money and he got inflammation of the eyes. Banks, over the course of the novel, until you get to this chapter, highlights one failure after the other that Brown experiences, which is, in the larger context, is a common denominator among revolutionary figures and radicals, is that failure becomes an inspiration for uh, radicalism and bearing witness. He starts a tannery in uh, Ohio, and that fails. Uh, he, in a sense, you could say that he is a failure as a father in the sense that he Marries, he, his first wife dies. He has a total of 22 children. Five sons die fighting with him. Uh, and one child, when he is uh, a wool merchant in Springfield, which is, uh, uh, occurs in the chapter you, re you read, although Banks doesn't discuss this, is Brown writes or finds out that the family uh, who is not in Springfield with him, who's in upstate New York, uh, there's a newborn baby, and because there's so many children, an older daughter is taking care of this newborn baby, she drops a pot of boiling water on the infant, and the infant dies. And Brown blames himself because he wasn't there. He wasn't providing for the family in the way that he should. Uh, he becomes a, and fashions himself as a businessman and a real estate developer uh, in towns in Ohio, and he uh, enters into bankruptcy. And in fact, the Panic of 1837 makes him a hopeless bankruptcy because he buys all this land on credit. And with the Panic of 1837 and subsequent depression, which lasts six years, it's one of the worst depressions in American history, uh, analogous to the Great Depression of the 30s, real estate values drop 90% in many areas. And so Brown is hopelessly bankrupt. That coincides with what is considered the first iconic uh, abolitionist martyr, Elijah Lovejoy, who's murdered near Brown uh, in Alton, Illinois, in the Midwest. And when Brown, knowing that he's bankrupt, learns of Elijah Lovejoy's 
um, murder by a pro-slavery mob, he uh, goes to his church on a Sunday, and at the end of the service, he stands up in the church and he pronounces, here before God in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. He makes one final venture into business as a wool merchant, which you read about, and he goes bankrupt there. Well, what are the effects of these failures? Bank, banks charts these out over the course of the novel, so I'm partly summarizing some of the narrative um, uh, themes of the novel. One is Brown becomes much more fervently religious. Uh, banks rightfully refers to him as a kind of Puritan. Many scholars, perhaps most, has co have called Brown a Calvinist. Uh, I don't because technically one of the defining characteristics of Calvinism is the understanding that God is inscrutable. You do, we cannot know God's will. The most we can do is have signs, seek for signs of God's will. Brown is a prophet. He sees himself in his quote, he, I'm an instrument in God's hand. He's, he is acting out what he believes to be God's will, calling for the destruction or the end of slavery. It's another common theme in radicals and reformers in the United States, the prophetic tradition, particularly for outsiders. Frederick Douglass also saw himself as a prophet or radical. If you are an outsider, you don't have much cultural power or capital. Believing that you are acting out God's will liberates you from the burdens of responsibility and the costs of your transformation and is immensely, can be immensely empowering. Another effect of uh, Brown's bankruptcy is he is, um, he, he has to, his um, forecloses on his house, so he's essentially homeless. And at this moment, Garrett Smith, this wealthy upstate New Yorker, uh, who had finally himself recovered from near bankruptcy, now has enough money, recovered some of his wealth, he decides to give away all of his wealth to poor New York State blacks. It's the largest single act of philanthropy by an individual to other individuals in American history. He gives away 40 acres of land to some 3,000 poor black uh, 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 men and women in upstate New York and land that he had inherited in Franklin and Essex County in the Adirondacks. Uh, and, and it be, makes uh, national news. Most uh, um, observers at the time who are not abolitionists call Garrett Smith a, a lunatic. Brown sees it and he makes a pilgrimage to Garrett Smith's home. Garrett Smith uh, uh, gives him some deeds in Brown for the rest of his life. He considers this area that Brown and the other blacks called Timbuktu the name for the fabled West African city, the site of great culture, great civilization, innovation, and farming, uh, diverse society. This is, becomes Brown's home. Uh, and it's there that he begins to become much more militant and envision his scheme of first raiding the South be, starts out with a um, subterranean pathway, pathway. Uh, which you read about in the chapter. It's this idea that Brown is going to use the mountains of the Alleghenies and the Adirondacks and take some hand-picked men um, and create forts in these mountains and, and liberate slaves from the Upper South and run them up from the Allegh Alleghenies to the Adirondacks. And it greatly um, increases slave prices. It uh, undermines the single most valuable commodity of Southerners, which is slaves. Slaves at this time, from 1830 to 1860, slaves were the most valuable commodity in the United States. Southerners were by far the wealthiest Americans. The one, the only commodity that did nothing but go up from 1830 to 1860 was the price of slaves. And there was a slave market, much as there was already a Wall Street stock market, much there as there was a commodity market for um, cotton and other goods. Land prices fluctuated, cotton fluctuates, uh, slaves do nothing but go up. Uh, Brown becomes close friends with Douglas, Harriet Tubman, Martin Delaney, Willis Hodges, many other blacks. 
Frederick Douglass offers, a, a Brown, a Russell um, mentions this in the novel, he quotes Douglass, describing his first meeting with John Brown, in which Douglass says, though white, John Brown is in his sympathies a black man and is as deeply interested in our cause as though his soul had been pierced with the iron of slavery. For John Brown and for Frederick Douglass and virtually every ex-slave, slavery itself constituted a state of civil war. The, how you understand and define slavery is that it's a civil war between master and slave. Thus, Brown saw himself as a peacemaker. The civil war is raging in this country. My job is to end this war and preserve the peace. And the only way to end the war is through righteous violence. That was his understanding. And when he meets Douglas in 47, that was Douglas's understanding. Although Douglas was not nearly as uh, um, flamboyant and uh, imprudent as Brown. Douglas supports the subterranean passway, but not Harper's Ferry, uh, as Russell points out. Um, Brown then goes to Kansas with Owen and five sons and sons-in-law. In fact, Kansas erupts into civil war following the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opens northern territories to slavery. Uh, and it's in uh, Kansas where Brown becomes nationally known as a heroic warrior. Uh, Brown is widely seen by anti-slavery northerners as helping to save the territory of Kansas from becoming a slave state. Now, his notorious act while he's there is that this is a, a, a region in which, that, in which civil war has erupted. Civil war is already occurring in Kansas. It's in the form of guerrilla warfare. Uh, abolitionists um, were uh, on record as, uh, pro, for pro-slavery people, if you were an abolitionist, you could be, and many were murdered on sight. Uh, and in uh, May of 1856, uh, pro-slavery uh, forces carrying flags of uh, Kansas for white supremacy, Kansas for Alabama, seeking to make Kansas like another southern state. They torched the uh, free state stronghold of Lawrence, Kansas. They burned down all the buildings. They murdered some abolitionists. And in retaliation, John Brown, uh, with his five sons and sons-in-law, walks to this um, isolated creek along the Pottawatomie River. Uh, and he, in the middle of the night, he yanks out five pro-slavery men. They don't own slaves, but they're pro-slavery. They're unarmed. And in the middle of the night, he has his men um, murder them, axing them to death with broadswords. Now, Brown's deeds at Potawatomi do not make national news. The national press obscures. They, it's, it's unclear who's done it, because, in part because there's so much warfare. Brown is nothing if not a warrior, and Banks is fascinated by this, the uses and the costs uh, of violence. <clears throat> It's from Kansas that he then trains his men uh, for this uh, raid on Harper's Ferry, the subterranean passway Brown decides will take too long, the bank sketches out over the course of the novel, and let's, let's end slavery in one fell swoop by taking over the federal arsenal in uh, what was then Virginia, the largest arsenal in the country, um, distribute the arms to free blacks and slaves in the surrounding area. Brown had the support of many black leaders from Harriet Tubman, Martin Delaney, and others, and they said that we'll, black, we will let blacks know through our grapevine telegraph that you're coming, uh, and we can use the mountains like Toussaint the Overture used the mountains in Haiti. Uh, so although we're outnumber, the mountains can be our source, our, uh, a, 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 a fortress for us and it will lead to uh, an immediate end of slavery because of the horror that it creates and Southerners will realize that they are um, living on a slumbering volcano, a term that Frederick Douglass used. And so that's what leads to Harper's uh, Ferry. Brown gets support from um, mostly Bostonians, aside from Garrett Smith, some of the best known Bostonians, many, most of them Harvard graduates. Uh, Samuel Gridley Howe, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Theodore Parker, George Stearns, Franklin Sanborn. Uh, these are wealthy white men who had been radicalized by the Fugitive Slave Law, which Banks talks about in this novel. 
When Brown raids Harper's Ferry, he writes a provisional constitution that fulfills what he sees as the ideals that should be in the U.S. Constitution, which is, would be for him to echo the Declaration of Independence uh, in the ideals of equality uh, and freedom. And the preamble of his provisional constitution says, whereas slavery is a most barbarous, unprovoked, and unjustifiable war of one portion of its citizens upon another, in utter disregard and violation of these eternal truths set forth in our Declaration of Independence, we will then make war, essentially. His sacred texts, John Brown's, are the Bible, the Declaration of Independence, and ideally the Constitution. Hence, the provisional Constitution constitutes what he sees as an ideal. Brown sees God's law and American law as one and the same. Uh, he does not see himself as treasonous. Uh, and in fact, John Quincy Adams, from John Quincy Adams to Lincoln, the legal constitutional justification for making civil war against slave owners and freeing the slaves is that Quincy Adams, who was one of the foremost uh, scholars, constitutional scholars, said that the Constitution uh, authorizes the president or Congress to emancipate slaves in a state of civil war. And that was the language Lincoln ends up using. Brown essentially uses it for Harper's Ferry and his war. Now immediately after Harper's Ferry, after the capture, Brown is demonized everywhere in both the North and the South. The, the Southern white see Brown, John Brown as their worst nightmare incarnate because the Southern white's worst nightmare is the specter of a slave insurrection. And from the mind of a Southern white's, the only thing worse than a slave insurrection like Nat Turner is a slave insurrection led by white because then it has more chances of succeeding in the mind of a Southern white. And this is John Brown with an interracial army. Now, Northerners initially think that, you know, this guy's a, he's, he's got to be a madman. And Brown, Brown's um, greatest moment as an orator, speaker, was as a prisoner. His prison letters are one of the great works of uh, literature. It rivals any of the great prison letters in world history. Brown frequently said, words, 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 it's a, you know, empty rhetoric, it's a national institution. I want action. Ironically, words are the, one, are the things that, um, turn, that, that made Harper's Ferry a catalyst for the Civil War because he convinced most Northerners to sympathize with him because of his public uh, embrace of his identification, empathy for slaves, and hatred of slavery. On the day that he was uh, sentenced to execution, November 2nd, 1859. He stands up before the court at Harper's Ferry. He's um, horribly injured. In fact, he's brought to the court on a stretcher because he can barely stand up. He stands up with, uh, before the court with, in great pain and says, I see a book kissed here. He's um, putting his hand on the Bible. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, or at least the New Testament, that teaches me that all things whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I should do even so to them. It teaches me further to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavored to act up to that instruction. I am yet too young to understand that God is any respecter of persons. In God's eyes, all people are equal. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I've always freely admitted I have done, in behalf of his despised poor, I did no wrong but right. And that just electrifies Northerners. Henry David Thoreau and Walfrado Emerson, two of the preeminent white public intellectuals of the day, 
after reading this speech, and Southerners make a mistake by allowing John Brown's words to circulate in the North, Emerson and Thoreau read John's speech, Brown's speech, and they say, John Brown is like Christ. Thoreau gives the speech three times. He tries to publish it as a pamphlet. No publisher will publish it because it's considered too radical. It's called, um, it's uh, on the Captain John Brown. Uh, in which he says, 1,800 years ago, Christ was crucified. Tomorrow, the day before Brown's executed, tomorrow Brown, perchance, will be hanged. There's a straight line between one and the other. And it makes national news. And that inspires Emerson, who's much more cautious about taking a stand on social and political issues of the day. But Emerson says, borrowing words from his friend, uh, the, fe the female abolitionist, Maddie Griffith, says, John Brown will make the gallows glorious like the cross. And it just hits national news. And that leads the that majority of Northerners to have great respect and sympathize for John Brown, even if they oppose his militant action. They greatly admired his principled opposition to slavery. Thoreau is representative when he says, I consider John Brown the greatest transcendentalist because transcendentalism is first and foremost uh, someone who is principled in uh, uh, their actions, who acts on their ideals. And for Southerners to see the mo majority of Northerners calling Brown a hero and a martyr how can they remain in a union with Northerners like this? It, it is a major catalyst. In fact, Brown, according to some scholars, including myself, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, um, splits is one of the crucial factors that splits the National Democratic Party. Before John Brown, Stephen Douglas was the National Democratic shoe-in. Uh, and almost was elected in 1856. After John Brown's raid, the Democratic National Convention, Southern Democrats said, no way we want to be with you Northerners. So the Demo National Democratic Party splits. And when it splits, every Republican understands that whoever becomes the Republican nominee will win the election, probably, just based on electoral college breakdown. And Lincoln becomes then the candidate. Uh, Banks understands all this, so he's using Brown. And as you know from reading the chapter, the narrator, Owen, is immensely sympathetic to his father, but he doesn't sentimentalize him. He doesn't um, treat him as, an, un as a, uh, uh, an unproblematic hero. Banks explores the psychology of righteous violence, as well as sacrifice, the sources of anger, the limits of empathy, uh, the successes and limits of bearing witness, um, among other things in this book and even in this chapter. And uh, I'll start, um, let's just start focusing on the, on the <coughs> Banks's novel now in a wonderful um, passage uh, on chapter 10, three chapters before what you read, I'll begin here. Uh, Banks, as uh, Owen Brown writes, there is an anger that drives one not to suicide or even to contemplate it, but to place oneself in a situation which has as its outcome only two logical conclusions, a miraculous triumph over one's enemies or one's own death, so that the line between suicide and martyrdom is drawn so fine as not to exist. I think that's a brilliant passage that just captures the psychology of a revolutionary who's willing to sacrifice his life. It's no coincidence that Russell Banks would go from John Brown, who told me this. Um, uh, I wrote him a fan letter when I was working on this dissertation. Um, he said, well, I'm not going to be working on Weather Underground. He said, you know, he said, and I said, of course, it would make complete sense. In fact, John Brown was an inspiration for the Weather Underground. One of their magazines was called Osawatomie. 
which was Brown was known um, as Osawatomie Brown, among other things. Um, and uh, so let, I put some passages up on my PowerPoint. I'm going to show you a few images and then go to the passages, and I'd love your responses or reactions, so I'm not forcing you to engage in the discussion, okay? This is a uh, daguerreotype owned by National Portrait Gallery of John Brown, uh, presumably uh, pledging allegiance to his subterranean passway flag. It relates to this chapter. Uh, it's actually a stunning daguerreotype. And Augustus Washington, the daguerreotypist, is an African-American daguerreotypist, African-American photographer in Springfield, who is one of John Brown's many black friends. This is John Brown uh, from the photographer John Bowles in Kansas in 1856, within two weeks plus or minus of John Brown's uh, notorious Pottawatomie massacre, where he hacks to death five unsuspecting, unarmed settlers. Here's Owen Brown, who is the narrator of Banks's book. Owen Brown uh, suffers for, uh, like the rest of Brown's surviving children, they suffer profoundly from Brown's uh, martyrdom and heroism. Beginning with their attempt to go to California after Brown's, uh, uh, during the Civil War, they're seeking to escape because every uh, sympathizer of the Confederacy or Copperhead Democrat sees Brown as the cause of this bloodbath of civil war. So the Brown family is going through Kansas on their way to um, California and they're almost murdered by Copperhead Democrats in Kansas. Uh, Owen Brown suffers um, mental depression at times, grappling with how to uh, confront, how to put to rest uh, his father and the influence of his father on him uh, and comes close uh, to suicide. This is Brown, Brown Tony Horwitz in his um, a wonderful uh, editorial said uh, that John Brown is, uh, or Harper's Ferry, is the 9-11 uh, of 1859 because of the way see we see you know, before and after 9-11. I would even go farther. Brown Braid is, as I said, the last catalyst of this, what becomes a social revolution. And we now know from other scholars, most notably Jim Oakes, that the, um, the idea that scholars had long felt that the Civil War was, uh, um, for much of the war, a war to preserve the Union and, all, and reluctantly it became a war to emancipate slavery, is dead wrong from the beginning. The war is understood by the Republican Party as a war to end slavery. The Union and emancipation are twinned from the beginning. And when Bre this is Brown in the front page of Frank Leslie's Illustrated after Harper's Ferry, I mean, he truly was the 9-11 uh, of 1859. Frank Leslie's Illustrated was the largest circulating newspaper in the um, country by far. And Brown was front page news for six months for six months. In fact, Brown remained front page news when the Democratic National Convention met in April. Here's a reconstruction. So these are um, engravings. This is an engraving based on a, a photograph. The photograph is by James Wallace Black. It's the last photograph, last known photograph of Brown. This is an engraving cut from the photograph, you see the similarities. It's before the age of halftone. Um, uh, Americans and British, the Illustrated Lond and London News, they, they interpreted the engravings cut from photographs as uh, authentic, truth-telling images. And much like, um, I'm curious, how many of you in this room, when you see a photograph, halftone photograph, in the uh, New York Times uh, question its veracity. Hands high, how many? Usually there's one or two. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's uh, 
Robert E. Robert e. Lee's troops breaking down the engine house where Brown has um, gathered uh, at Harper's Ferry. Here's Brown on a stretcher uh, being brought to the trial at Harper's Ferry. And here's uh, Frank Leslie's rendering of uh, Brown's execution. Uh, the only, the execution, because Southerners were so worried that there would be an attempt in the North to um, capture Brown and save him, only military personnel were allowed uh, anywhere near the execution. There was one individual who was not a military personnel, and that was John Wilkes Booth, who wanted to be, have a front row seat at the uh, Brown's execution. He was an actor. He had been acting nearby in Charlestown, and uh, he basically paid a soldier to don his uniform so he could pass as a soldier, had a front row, front row seat. John Wilkes Booth, by, like other Southern secessionists, loved Brown, even though they diametrically opposed in their views, because they saw in John Brown a fellow revolutionary. They, too, were interested in forging and starting a revolution. And so he, Booth loved Brown. And that's what Banks captures. Banks, you could say, Cloud Splitter, the novel as a whole, explores the costs and the problems and the dilemmas of revolution, of bearing, of radicals bearing witness in this attempt to radically transform society. Here's a and from the chapter you read, the catastrophic losses in England were such that at last my father would be able to forget about becoming a rich man. Uh, the final loss, the final bankruptcy from the wool merchant liberates him because that, you know, the one dream of saying I want to become a, a local, a patriarch in a local community and be a leader of my community through business, that's gone now. Released from that possibility, he went through a sort of sea change and began to be instead the man who entered history, the revolutionary. It's a wonderful encapsulation. And I, in my view, and I know the, the sources, it's a, a, a brilliantly accurate, pithy, somber, almost biblical in tone representation. Here's Owen, next page. And of course, things had changed at home too. The passage of the heinous Fugitive Slave Act, and Russell describes how heinous it was, virtually legitimates the kidnapping of every free black in the North. It electrified thousands of white men and women. Suddenly, our anger, Brown's anger, my anger, our consuming rage did not seem so odd anymore. Earlier, our alarm and anger and commitment had seemed evidence of our election, as it were, proof of our moral superiority. And the word election, I think, is significant. Proof of our moral superiority, meaning we're right with God. We're right with God. Now, however, we were no longer positioned amongst our people like prophets. We were, everyone else kind of rises to our level. So what happens? It was as if when our white neighbors finally woke to the threat of slavery and grew angry, we moved at once to the next stage and in that way kept our old position towards them intact. They come up to our position of radicalism, we go to the next level. And you still see that among activists, um, is who can be more radical than now? There's a kind of competition. Uh, the, the um, genuine humane desire to bear witness to atrocities is certainly one aspect, and Banks doesn't ignore that. But to reach a John Brown, there are other factors for this boiling anger. There are other factors that motivate him that he wants to explore. Uh, 
We would not allow ourselves to be like other white people. We would be angrier than they. We would risk and sacrifice more than they. We would be bloodier, more brutal, more consistently merciless and desperate than they. We were becoming like Negroes or wanted to become like them. Or, to be honest and exact, we were becoming the kind of men and women that we wanted Negroes themselves to be. This is a brilliant passage right here that encapsulates a central theme of the chapter about the dilemmas <laughs> of uh, interracial alliances and friendships. What do you make of it? Now remember, part of the brilliance, I think, of Banks using Owen as the, as the narrator is Owen is remembering Brown much as Banks himself reimagines Brown, so there can be this wonderful blur. And so this is Owen's um, retrospective understanding of he and his father from you know, 30 years earlier. Uh, so you have the, the, the distance, yes. Can, can you wait for the mic? The self-righteousness is what comes through to me um, in comparing themselves to other white people and then in saying we're becoming like Negroes or to be honest and exact, we were becoming the kind of men and women we wanted them to be. So that self-righteousness in relation to everybody else. And then you see Owen step back and acknowledge the self right in the last paragraph. We were becoming like Negroes or wanted to become like them. Or, to be honest, what we really wanted was to become what we wanted Negroes themselves to be. That's amazing. Yeah. What page is this? This um, is. Because I'm just wondering where that falls. Before the page. It's, uh, it's before the, uh, before the, um, the scene uh, where Brown, um, the scene of the League of Gilead. Which because what's poignant to me is this comes on 418, Owen asks his father, um, when did you first know that Negroes were as human as, as you yourself? And that, at least from a therapeutic standpoint, his answer after and how far back they go into their childhoods. childhoods. And there's a lot there, and that comes after this. And I wish we could discuss that a little bit. That's Those perfect. two passages juxtaposed. So how would you, how would you uh, juxtapose them? It's a great point, great question. Well, if you had never shown me a picture of John Brown, I have to say that a lot of times throughout this chapter, I thought that he was both um, childlike and adult-like. Childlike in that he, to me, he seems um, uninhibited, impulsive, imaginative, an adult-like in that he is calculating and analytical and experience and has some wisdom through, you know, through experience. Um, but that he, what he shares with Owen is this loss of mother, mm -hmm. this sense of aloneness that seems to pervade a lot of the questions that I think you originally asked in the very beginning about empathy, about you know, just how complex this guy is. If you dial back to his childhood and Owen's, you see the, this father and son in Russell Banks, you know, characterization of them. You know, you see them, at this moment anyway, joined by this common ground of having lost a mother um, and being as alone as the slave boy that was beaten and who didn't uh, have access to a mother or father, you know, so. Anyway. That's great. That's true. Thank you. So uh, um, let me just push you a little bit further. <laughs> how would you 
reconcile the passage you just read. When did you first know that Negroes were as human as yourself? This, this question in Brown's answer in this part right. highlights the successes of the empathic awareness in a sense. The, the, the ability to see the alien other as human, as equal, as like yourself. The passage I put up, up here yeah. highlights the limits. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile one success and one other limits? It just seems human. <laughs> Complex, just like most human beings, right. you know, and, and he ultimately, as do many of the Banks characters, they are so human because they are so complicated and good. they resonate because you are, I am. Right. Right. And I, I actually think he make, he's very careful at having this passage in Owen's um, memory some 30 years later. So there's the, there's the vantage point of distance, an ability for self-reflection for um, exploring deeply one's own previous deeds and actions. In a sense, you could say that this passage right here that highlights the limits is why history, rather than the form of fiction or um, of traditional history, is so important for us understanding the present. Um, it helps us um, complicate what our views might have been at this present moment. I'm thinking a lot about today and this present moment in our history Absolutely. and what's going on in our country and how you know one informs the history informs even today with the racial you That's know exactly right. today That's very good. That's very good. Yeah, in, in the back. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, I just finished reading the entirety of the book, so I'm basing this comment on that, but also um, admitting that I'm fresh off the book, so I'm still formulating what I, I think it can be argued that one of the greatest complexities of the book relates to what you just said um, about um, the fact that Owen is remembering at a distance, and that Owen is in fact not John Brown, so that we're at a remove from John Brown in his, through history, through the fact that this is a fiction, and then through the fact that it's Owen Brown, whom Russell Banks has created, through, through whose eyes we're going to see John Brown. And I think that one of the greatest complexities of the book, and one of the great ironies, and I'm again not sure about this, is that Russell Banks is suggesting to us that Owen Brown repeatedly misrepresents and misunderstands his father through the lens of his own pain, his suffering, his life as, his, as this man's son. And what I'm formulating and what I'm gonna to dare to just throw out there is the possibility that what this book does and what makes it a literary project as opposed to a historical one despite all its accuracies and its deep research is that the book is positing Owen as us, um, as the contemporary subject who's reading this story so that Banks creates our perspective here um, and says, can we possibly understand John Brown? Can we understand him on his terms or can we only understand him on our own? And I would even go so far as to say, and I don't know if you'll keep saying yes <laughs> when I say this, but that it's an unflattering portrait. Um, in other words, that whatever John Brown was, who I believe is repeatedly a man who understands things on terms that are not necessarily about empathy or humanity as we understand it, but deeply religious and, you know, I don't know enough about religion to say if this is correct, but ethical terms um, that are not the same as Owen Brown, who is driven by pain, by the relationship with his father, by a psychology that we can access. And that when Owen Brown creates a parallel between his own psychology around the loss of his mother and his father's, there's much in the books that suggests that Owen Brown is mistaken and he's desperately trying to create a connection that's not there. Um, and that this, to be honest and exact, we were becoming the kind of men and women that we wanted Negroes themselves to be is closer to what Owen Brown is, which is a man whose acts are about fashioning himself and his identity and negotiating his desires and his longing, um, which is very different from his father. And I think the contrasts in the chapter that we read together between the way that John Brown speaks 
um, to the congregation in Springfield and argues his point is very different from what Owen Brown believes is their reason, um, their, their raison d'etre for doing what they're doing. So I think that's part of what can't be reconciled, but is Russell Banks' point, if that makes Absolutely. sense. I think, that's a, I think that's a superb reading. I, I completely agree with every aspect of that. And I think your point about Banks' ultimate portrait of Brown is unflattering. And I would say yes, it depends on you know, how we define unflattering. It's honest is what it is. He's, it's honest in the sense that, you know, that he's cutting against the traditional mythology. You're a, a, a saint or a sinner. I mean, there's this tendency throughout history to cast heroes as perfect. W.B. Du Bois is brilliant on that, especially with regard to Lincoln. You know, Americans, white Americans, Lincoln has become a myth. He's perfect. He's flawless. Human beings, by their fundamental condition, are deeply flawed. And the condition of humanity is ultimately deeply unflattering. But that doesn't mean it's unsympathetic. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would add to that by unflattering. I mean, that's the central critique of the novel. That's yes. where the novel asks us to consider exactly. our position on that's race, right. on our own that's humanity. Right. That's, um, right. that's where it asks that's us to, right. to think. I, I think that's super. I mean, one of the ways I think Banks is also asking his readers to think about their position on race is, is through these two passages that we've been discussing. This last line here is, or to be honest, exactly, we were becoming the kind of men and women that we wanted Negroes themselves to be after saying we were becoming Negroes. Um, how many of you are familiar with Norman Wh Mailer's The White Negro? Um, it highlights the degree to which there's been a long tradition in American racial history of uh, whites who want to empathize with the plights of blacks or Native Americans or or anyone else, instead of to be able to, I mean, empathy is truly breaking down the distinctions, the duality between me and you, between the self and the other. And Banks is suggesting here, and in this chapter in the novel, in a sense, that the, that, that cannot happen. If you desire to break that, if you desire to become a Negro, you're retaining the same dichotomy of racial positions. You maintain that dualism. Uh, and in this chapter, he talks about, uh, or Owen, ha through Banks' mind, talks about uh, a healthier approach is not trying to become black, but simply understanding the power of one's whiteness. And without becoming black, shedding your whiteness. Uh, which, uh, I mean, at that time, he's at the forefront of what becomes in the academy, it's called whiteness studies, abolishing one's whiteness, this sense of superiority, without retaining that um, binary black white by becoming black. In Mayor's White Negro, the condition of blackness is a more authentic mode of being. And so, you know, let's whites, let's become these uh, hipster blacks as radicals. It's not breaking down the issue there. It's retaining, just flipping it, just flipping the dichotomy. And uh, through Owen Brown's reflections, you see in the, the, the passages between Owen, Owen Brown speaking at the time, at the moment, and then his reflections, you see how it grows, and that's, that's um, I think that's significant in the novel. But thank you for that. That's great. great point. Other comments? Yes. One of the words that's been mentioned a little bit recently is the word pain, and I think that is a layer of truth-telling that's missing, both from this quote and from the quote on 418. If we think that John Brown's anger and Owen's anger and the anger of others in 
um, the earlier book we read, um, The Sweet Hereafter, um, the level of pain in those characters is so great because they don't have what they want. We want these Negroes to be something other than they are, and it's causing us pain. Or the lawyer in The Sweet Hereafter who lost his daughter and was, you know, led to great pain. Um, and many of Banks's characters. And if we recognize that anger, that we're talking about the anger of the revolutionary, the anger of the lawyer, the anger of the, uh, you know, um, the Southerners about not having what they want, which is the preservation of slavery, but underneath it is the pain, then we're missing a layer of truth telling about it. And I think the difference is that honestly sharing their pain, or any of us honestly sharing our pain, um, can have a little bit of healing, but it's not very powerful. Just awful, ain't it awful? And see you later, is a lot different than, by God, I'm mad and I'm not going to take it anymore. And so when I read this, I see it as the foolproof formula of success because their anger, they get to be angry at the way things are, the way things were, and why they're not the way they want them to be. And they generate action. When he says action, 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 they generate that out of the illusion of anger instead of the truth of the pain. The anger displays the pain. Right. That's, very, that's a superb thing. Um, and thank you for making the connection, which I was hoping you know, some of you would do, between the pain and anger that's such a major theme in Sweet Ralph in the chapter. And, this, and indeed in all of Banks's works. Um, so. so let me ask you one question based on that. You, I completely agree with you about. Um, this novel and Banks' works in general um, suggesting that redemption is not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, or is there something that, if one doesn't displace pain with anger and one confronts one's pain, can, you, can in this novel, for example, in the chapter you read, can there be a um, at least a, um, an, uh, a step toward redemption, if not redemption? Or is there another word that would be used? Are you asking me? I, I think that uh, Brown's contemporaries um, came close to it when they recognized that he was Christ-like in the sense that the redemption's already a done deal. It's not something that we have to do individually. Mm -hmm. We have to take responsibility for acting out of it, but the redemption is already That's right. That's set. Very good. Yeah. That's very good. And you could even take that further, and it's actually a central theme among many Christians, and that is that um, the tension between Christ as an object of their faith where redemption, you said, is already a given, and uh, Christ as an exemplar, as he becomes to be great for John Brown. Uh, and can, is it either one or the other? Is Christ either an object of faith or an exemplar, but not both? Or can there be a blurring? And that question is actually debated by Christians and theologians. I don't know if you're about to get to this, but um, the thing I kind of keep thinking about, and um, certainly David's email provoked this, um, you know, this idea of sacrificing children. You know, I mean, so Christ is the sacrifice. John Brown, you know, the, the idea of we sacrificing children, of course, John Brown is willing to sacrifice his son, but he's also willing to sacrifice everybody else. And I, I mean, I, if you think, you know, but they also make the point that, you know, we're all God's children. You know, the blacks are God's children, the whites are, we're all God's children. So I'm not really sure where that takes us, except that everybody gets sacrificed. And depending on how broad your view is, you know, by the end of the 
book at least, nobody wins. So. Which had hence the unflattering portrait. Yeah. You know, hence the unflattering portrait. You know, Brown, Brown, I think it's a great point. And Brown, in, in a sense, becomes a kind of mullet figure. Yeah. The great, you know, the, the uh, um, Canaanite idol to whom children are sacrificed as burnt offerings. Mm. His uh, blood children. Moloch is generally not seen as uh, sympathetic, mm. but it, it really, so he, Banks, I, I think, brilliantly um, uh, uh, offers a much more um, subtle and ambiguous and ambivalent understanding of this notion of sacrifice. Yeah, yeah I'd just like to say more about this notion of sacrifice in the novel, especially respect to this, with respect to this passage and what you brought out about this idea of self-righteousness. Because, as Leslie said, I, I think that, um, you know, looking at the novel from the outside, and I confess I haven't read the whole thing, but looking at, from the, at the novel from the outside, and I see um, several of John Brown's sons having died and Owen having mm -hmm. um, suffered so much. Um, and, and the sacrifice I want to think about, or I'm spurred to think about, is the the near sacrifice of Isaac, the binding of Isaac, that for righteousness, for the sake of righteousness, right? And it's almost, that's right. And, and it's almost more, I mean, it's almost especially fitting because it's a near sacrifice like Owen. Owen isn't finally sacrificed, but for the sake of righteousness. But in this chapter, what I thought was interesting is when John Brown and Owen speak of sacrifice, they don't speak about the Akedah. They don't speak about Mount Moriah. They speak about, uh, the, the consecration of Aaron to be a priest. John Brown says to, to Frederick Douglass, let me be Aaron to your Moses. I will, I will kill the animals and sprinkle myself with blood so I may be the chosen priest. And then when he, he says, and then he says, I'm willing to sacrifice my children. And Frederick Douglass looks at Owen and Owen says, I will be Aaron to my father's Moses, right? And so it's about setting themselves apart, using the blood of others to set themselves apart as righteous. Right? And so there's this public, public statement and proclamation of righteousness, which is actually the contrary of what Abraham does, because it, what's necessary for Abraham, as many you know, postmodern thinkers have reminded us, is that his righteousness must be secret. This has to be a command that no one knows, and it's just the one that he knows, and he can't make this, the reasons for his sacrifice public. And so this, the novel at large sort of batters us with this, this idea of sacrifice, which is very prominent in the Christian tradition, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, if we can use that phrase. But on their self-understanding, or at least Owen's self-understanding and his inflection of, of John Brown here, it's a different kind of sacrifice. It's about making themselves righteous in a very public way. And which, you know, and I, when I hear about the Potawatomi massacre and the, the sprinkling of blood and these things as making him wholly a priest for this movement somehow, these things become much darker and the idea of sacrifice becomes much more complicated. Very good. And then, that's, thank you for that. And then what's so fascinating is Owen in the same chapter says, no, I, I offer this Public utterance, it's actually, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> only, in, only in retrospect, it doesn't recognize it. I didn't mean it. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Just because it was such an intuitive you know, response to the book, even though you haven't read the whole book. Um, Isaac is actually, and I'm sure you can talk to it, maybe even point us to the passage that I would be hopeless to find, but um, Akedat Yitzchak is definitely, like the Akedat is definitely um, prominent in this book for Owen, actually, not for John Brown, who speaks of Job, who speaks of Gilad, um, but who doesn't speak um, as much of, of, of uh, Abraham and Isaac as Owen does. And interestingly, Owen makes an attempt to rewrite he actually rewrites the Akedah story um, and wishes to retell it where Isaac has a part in it and says what he believes God has shown him, um, which leads to his, his, his salvation, um, not in the way that Isaac was saved. And I, I can't remember exactly. Maybe you can help us find it. But I also want to say that this book is also constructed on the idea of a betrayal, not by John of Owen, but by Owen of the men who die with John, and, and maybe even of his father. 
um, in, in that, and this is related to history, so it's not a spoiler, um, in that um, John Brown um, hoped to secure uh, Frederick Douglass's support for Harper's Ferry, and in this book, and, and you'll have to tell us historically if this is true, led the men who was with him, um, and I, I think th there was a man who survived who said that they were led to believe um, that Douglas had supported Harper's Ferry and would rendezvous with them, would meet them, would, would organize um, escaped slaves um, in a rebellion. Um, and Owen Brown and John Brown both know in this narrative that Frederick Douglass has said no, he cannot support the hopeless act of Harper's Ferry, even though he supports the passageway um, and, and much of what um, John Brown is doing. John Brown chooses not to tell the men that Frederick Douglass has denied his support on the basis of faith. He believes, and this is John Brown, who is a man of faith, who has done everything according to faith, right and wrong, literally following what he's seen in the Bible. He believes, based on faith, that Frederick Douglass will come around. So he doesn't tell the men because he believes he will. But Owen Brown does not believe he will. He does not have that faith and chooses not to tell, allows them to go to their death. That's the betrayal. And there may be a, a Christian reference here that, um, but I'm, I'm coming more from the, from the um, Old Testament tradition myself. So um, I believe that if we're going to look at the sacrifice of children, the figure who has the psychology and the culture um, and the socialization of sacrifice that I think Russell Banks is about to speak to us about in November is actually Owen, which is the unflattering portrait that I'm talking, yes, um, that, I, that I mean to reference there, that we're driven by certain, by an axis of needs and, and, and goals that lead to the sacrifice of our children. That's Owen's portrayal, not John's, if that can make sense without having read the novel. So I just couldn't resist responding because you really got Thank that. you. Okay. That's, a, that's a wonderful um, analysis. and. Actually, uh, just an anecdote or detail to support or bolster it, there's no historical evidence at all um, for uh, the Raiders believing that Brown or that Douglas would end up. Douglas did need to come back to the, he needed to re like leave the states after Harper's Ferry and then come back historically and, did, and, and, make, and clarify that he did not support it, though, historically, right? He, Supported Brown, but so he so the details are um, he has this two-day meeting with um, Brown um, in the chambers for Pennsylvania. He, um, Douglas brings a uh, former slave, Shields Green, from South Carolina, with him. Brown tries to convince Douglas for two days to come with him to be his right hand man. Douglas says, "I don't want to go." It's not that he opposes violence, but he's what I call a prudent revolutionary. He says, you're entering a steel trap. You're going to die. Uh, I don't want to die. Um, I think it's uh, explosive. Um, he goes back to Rochester, where he's like, Shields Green is convinced. So you have this amazing moment where these two blacks come to a meeting with John Brown and John Cagey, two white men, to try to convince him. And Shields Green goes with him. I think he'll go with the old man. And Douglas goes back. And Shields Green, Shields Green dies at Harper's Ferry with him. Douglas is, uh, when Sharper's Ferry occurs, is at, uh, giving a talk in uh, Philadelphia. And because Brown is a close friend of Douglas, Brown, in his knapsack, and I think it was intentional on Brown's part, he wants to bring all the evidence that his raid uh, is endorsed by these major leaders. So there are letters between like, Frederick Douglas and Brown. They're relatively innocent. <laughs> But Buchanan, the President Buchanan, says, you know, here's an opportunity to arrest the leading abolitionist and leading black in the country. So he essentially issues a, uh, a warrant for Douglas' arrest for accessory before the fact. And fortunately, an abolitionist in Philadelphia who's um, running the telegraph um, receives the arrest warrant to send to the sheriff to say, arrest Frederick Douglass. He's given a talk in uh, in Philly, and the telegraph operator withholds that telegraph mm -hmm. for three hours, gets news to Douglas, Douglas takes the next train, reaches Rochester, and then goes to Canada. He was lucky to escape with his life. And from Canada, that's where he writes, and he expresses his guilt. <coughs> he said, you know, maybe I just lacked spine. Uh, but he's also responding to many, this is still very early before the widespread sympathy in which um, many reports were 
calling Brown mad. And Douglas says, whatever else you say of John Brown, whether he's a bad tactician or an imprudent, um, you do not call him a madman. If you call John Brown mad, you have to call the uh, revolutionary or founding fathers mad. That's what Brown was acting on. And really, and then he, Douglas goes to England for six months to until the um, Senate uh, investigating committee uh, concludes and decides not to arrest anyone else because it would incite more uh, sectional tensions. So then Douglas can return without fear of being arrested. And for the rest of his life, Douglas refers to John Brown as the greatest individual in the 19th century, with Lincoln second. Um, so he's, uh, he both um, sees and Douglas admitted that he was a hero worshiper. He's unambiguous about, um, or comparatively unambiguous about his heroes. Uh, so on the one hand, saying why he didn't participate, on the other hand, saying and acknowledging <coughs> So, uh, but I think your, your statement that this discussion is superb. I think you encapsulate a central theme of the novel, which frankly, no critic has, I mean, you should write this up. There's, this is, there's no criticism that captures this. The two of you do a joint essay. <laughs> I'm familiar with the criticism. Uh, yes. Okay, it's always the furthest person away. <laughs> I actually don't have a, um, a, I have more a, a question of a place that I'd love to hear some discussion about, especially in terms of the, um, the, the children motif that we're talking about in Banks' work. We're on page 417, 418. I don't know if this is a passage you're going to bring up where he talks about um, Brown secretly wanting to think of himself as a child yeah. and of children, that that passage I found uh, Again, particularly with, with the theme that we've been talking about, um, I'd just love to hear some discussion of it. I don't know if people have, uh, as we say in my field, the text in front of them. <laughs> yeah, um, should I read it or? Yeah, Do you want me to, okay, just, um, and just to say in advance that if there are sort of biblical resonances with this, there are two um, child, main child passages in the New Testament. One is in Matthew where you talk about entering the kingdom of God becoming like little children. The second, of course, is in, is in Paul's letter, I think is to the Corinthians, where he talks about setting silage aside in order to become an adult and mature, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So um, this is after the passage where he's talking about Brown was, of course, not one of them. He was not black, he was white, and he talks about privilege and power, okay? Then he goes on and he says, and yet there are not adult men and women with all the powers, privileges, and prerogatives of adults. Are there not, okay, uh, adult men and women with all the power, et cetera, who secretly think of themselves as children? Is it not as if our large, hairy bodies are merely fortunate disguises, and some of us are children going about in the adult world like spies? our heart breaking daily at the sight of what our fellow children must suffer solely as a consequence of their not being as cleverly disguised as we. In cautious silence, we observe the cruelties and indignities, the inequities and powerlessness they must endure until at last their bodies too grow large and hairy like ours and they are able to pass into the general population of adults where, like most people, they either forget that they were ever children themselves, or else they too become spies. We dare not identify ourselves one to the other for fear that we will lose the powers and the privileges of adulthood. And so we remain silent, whilst other people's children are beaten instead of nurtured, whilst other people's children are humiliated and bullied instead of taught whilst other people's children are treated as property, as objects of little value, instead of as human beings no less valuable in the eyes of the Lord than are we ourselves. I believe that it was like this for Father, and became like this for me as well, that very early in his life, he came to feel towards white people generally as an unusually sensitive child feels toward the brutal, unfeeding adults, unfeeling adults generally,
He felt powerless, humiliated, and deprived, and felt it so strongly, so vividly, that he could not put it away when the circumstances which he had brought about those feelings changed and no longer applied to him. That's to say, when he had become an adult himself and saw himself as white. Instead, he began dreaming himself as a Negro man. If he was anything like me, and I believe that he was, because his dreams of himself as a child was too much a nightmare to endure and too powerful an experience for him to forget. This did not mean that he saw Negroes as children, and certainly not as childlike, any more than he saw himself as a child or childlike. He merely saw them in their relation to white people as his natural allies. Yeah. <laughs> so I've just very much, yeah. No, I'd very much like to hear um, what people have to say. It, you know, I had questions about the way he was positioning children, you know, as beaten and brutalized and so forth, as adults in the position of power and, and white. The ambivalence that you've been talking about, others have been talking about, the portrait of own of his father. He wants to be like the child. He sees himself in this brutalized position he can't forget. On the other hand, he's white. He sees himself as becoming the aggressor, um, in fact, the powerful, privileged person. And, and then this notion that, oh no, blacks are not, you know, as children, he's not positioning them as children, he's the adult, but um, natural allies. Um, that um, all, yeah, I just love to hear what anyone else has to say. <laughs> If we go back to that question of pain, someone who envisions themselves as a child um, has hope. You know, there's always hope for a happy childhood, even when you're 80 years old. You know, there's, it's not too late for a happy childhood. It can be transformed. And so when I think about Owen and his father both admitting they have these dreams where they position themselves as children, it's, it's ex a brief experience of pain killing. Mm -hmm. And when I've read these two, um, I'm gonna go back and read all of Russell Banks' work now, but I think underneath it, he's trying to tell us that we use our children as our own painkillers. That's very interesting because I didn't see any happy portrait of child here at all, you know. On the contrary, the children are described only as beaten, humiliated, bullied. It, it, do you know what I mean? So it seemed to me that what he was doing with, with children is he has this one line about human beings no less valuable in the eyes of the Lord than we are ourselves. You know, that, that there is this, there is that, that, that Mathean passage about becoming his children, okay? But not that it's a happy state. And if anything, I read this as wanting to escape the fact that he was white by pretending he wasn't white, wasn't privileged. And so rather than feeling this, that sort of happiness, it was a kind of a way to escape the responsibilities of the fact that being white, one is in that position of power and privilege over against those who are. And, and this, what struck me as overly overwhelming was not happiness, but the, but the talk about silence, about, about you know, b remaining silent. Um, and it seemed to me that he was saying that pretending I as an adult, I, I, I as a white person, am really a child, i.e. the beaten, tortured person, um, uh, that allows me to um, uh, escape this kind of, uh, of having to deal with that. So I just read it differently than you did. That's, but yeah, at least the, the, the imagination of children didn't seem very happy. <laughs> Well, it's what led me to the back to this passage to begin with, and then I realized how the children motif, is just because this is the place where it's in the eyes of the Lord. And that's maybe where the redemption is, not for anybody here, but only in the eyes of God. Yeah. <laughs>
I, I actually saw this, I mean, I think what I'm stating is gonna be obvious, but this passage as Banks' attempt, his contemporary attempt to tell us why um, uh, John Brown did what he did, right? It's an explanation, it's a fundamental explanation, and I think if we go back to what Ellie said about, there's, there's a dichotomy here, and I, I hope that Banks is, is in control of this, is Owen is a modernized psychology, right? He's working on all the same principles and understandings of how we raise children, how we deal with children, um, why we do what we do, why, re why we incite rebellion, right? And, and John is working on another fundamentally different principle, and I'm just gonna pass this over to Ellie for one second, because can you, can you um, talk about the, the part with Job and the explaining, because I think that sort of is gonna get, because I think getting at the point of we're dealing with different psychologies, different historical psychologies, right? And, and so that's the beauty of, of the book and why Ellie is saying that um, it's an unflattering portrait. It's only unflattering from the position of a modern reader, from us, right? And, and Owen is explaining John's radicalism through, a mo through modern psychological principles. So let me just pass it over to her and let her t talk about that really quickly so that you can show the difference between the modern, the, the modern and the non, I mean, the transitional, it's called Brown transitional psychology. Okay, this wasn't planned, but we talked about this a little bit before, and I'll try to do it quickly, because I know um, we don't have a lot of time, but, and I will say that every time I say unflattering, um, and I'm, in this case, when I'm talking about Owen, I, I mean compassionately unflattering. You know, oh my God, look at this state we're in, you know, what can we do for ourselves and our children? But um, the moment that I think Lisa is asking me to talk about, it's very early, it's rather early in the book, um, when the family is living in New York in North Elba, and they're um, playing a big role in the, um, Underground Railway, um, and uh, Underground Railroad, and they are they have the cooperation of many white, fa several white families in the area, um, in addition to the black community on Jarrett Smith's land, um, and they pass they they help uh, a, a young black couple escape from slavery, um, a young man and a young woman. Um, there, there's even though this was evident anyway, it is emphasized that this woman was probably. Um, being sexually um, abused and 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 otherwise by by the master, um, and the, they are secretly husband and wife, and they're escaping. Um, and uh, the community helps them escape, and then shortly after they they make their way through this town, um, a warrant comes out for their arrest. It's not um, to retrieve them as escaped slaves, but a warrant for their arrest for murdering their master. And when that news comes through, and, and the community, um, the white families who've been assisting, say, wait a second, right? We thought we were helping escape slaves. That, on moral terms, was okay with us. Um, but we're not gonna help murderers escape. That's not okay, right? And at that moment, as a contemporary reader, I'm saying, oh, wait a second. Th th these are two human beings who were being brutalized and probably had no choice but to kill this person in order to escape that, that brutalization. Of of course, it's the same as any other escaped slave on the Underground Railroad. And um, I'm ready for John Brown to tell that to the community. In fact, he gathers everyone at the church, and he's going to stand up and speak to them and persuade them not to leave this operation. But when he stands up and speaks to them, he doesn't say any of that, not anything that I'm expecting as a modern reader to hear. Instead, he tells the story of Job. <laughs> um, and he... And he points to the fact that we do not obey God when God only when God rewards us or when it is comfortable for us. Um, and I hope I'm summarizing his point with Job correctly here. But but when um, but but always but always. And I was you know it's early in the book and I'm like wait what you could have said that other stuff John <laughs> what are you doing and of course and he actually does not succeed in persuading any of the white families to go with him. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I forget Owen's reaction in that moment, although he, he often is a detractor of his father in that he simply can't get on board because he himself does not have faith. Um, he is not religious. Um, so I think Lisa's asking me to bring up this moment because it's a wonderful moment that illustrates that even John Brown's rhetoric is not based on something that's familiar to us. As much as we sit here and say, we, we are on the side of the abolitionists, we are on the side of at least, there's a complexity around John Brown's methods, um, 
great complexity, but we are on the side of his goals. Um, and yet, when I think as a modern reader we hear him, he's not working again on the terms that we operate on. And Owen Brown, for that reason, has trouble following him and constantly beats himself up for that and struggles with that and betrays him on and off and betrays others. So I think Lisa's asking me to bring that up as an illustration of that different psychology that the book is saying, not only do we struggle to access this, but we must understand that it is foreign to us for a reason. It is of a, of a different time and a different world. And what? And let's understand how we are operating here so that we can tend to ourselves and the way we treat our children. It's one of the reasons why bank uses the term Puritan to characterize Browns as a way to say this. This is a different worldview, different, uh, different eschatologies. Um. But I, but I also think it's not just two um, his historical psychologies, but also two different historical stages of the revolution and post in a post-revolutionary context. And I, I think that in part that stance of Owen is that like we're in a post-revolutionary context. So what do we do in a post-revolutionary context? And um, where does all that anger and fervor and lawlessness go? And like what is what is the next stage? Do we fall into just nostalgia? For the revolutionary area, what you know, what kind of order are we in now, or do we are we looking out for the next rev, the next revolution? Are we trying to see whatever, or or is there some other? And that I think gets your redemption question too. And um, resonates so much with the present moment in which Banks is writing this. Right, absolutely. That's what I. That's why I'm. A, yeah, I'm always interested in the the point. I, I looked up the date again and when he wrote this because I realized when I got this that he'd signed. I had gone to a book reading and he'd signed this book. I was like, like, oh yeah, I went to him reading this. So I was looking up and I'm always interested in okay, what point is he writing that and what are the live issues at the point that he's writing the novel that are also informing, you know, what he's writing. And I think, I think this whole post-revolutionary concept. And when we think about that, and anyone who's ever traveled anywhere where you're, you know closer to when a revolution happened maybe and 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 people really having to face that issue so i'd, I'd love you know people's thoughts about that and not just in the u.s but in france and one of the characteristics of the post-revolutionary moment is the tendency to sentimentalize or romanticize the that's right and then there's also reactionaries and then there's then there's just what happened in reconstruction which is which is itself yeah yeah <laughs> oh, uh, let me show, go back, I'll just, as you're walking out, um, I will play. Looking kindly down on the grave of old John Brown. 
think. Thank you, my man. Here. Thank you. That's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> oh, oh, my man. I'll give you a fist bump in my room. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you for that. Oh, no, please. Please. So just a couple quick comments. Uh, I'm so relieved to see how engaged you are with the uh, novel and the work because I want to remind you that the purpose of these seminars, in my mind, has always been to move from the notion of a celebrity visit where you go to one lecture and you're there and it's kind of great and it's interesting and the person leaves to a, a, a relationship that we form with Banks' work and that we're prepared for that lecture in a much more powerful, meaningful way. And that's the idea behind these seminars, so that you're already engaged with Russell before he comes. Um, and I think it's going to be a much richer experience for you and for him. Um, and I'm, I'm just so pleased by what I've seen today. Um, I, I was talking to Russell on the phone the other day about Cloud Splitter, and I was talking about John's work and so forth. He was really pleased. Um, and, and he was saying, you know, the thing about John Brown is, he's, you know, we, we know the facts. We said, we know the facts. He says, but people are always arguing about the facts. He said, and what I was trying to do in this novel was to give you people a sense of what is, was the meaning of the facts. What was the meaning of John Brown's life uh, to me? And he says, he was really, he said, it's really about the meaning. He was really big on the meaning. So some of you who are interested in meaning, it looks like it's coming back uh, in scholarship, even though some people have tried to push it aside. Mm -hmm.